Guy Davis, welcome to E-Town. Thank you very much. Glad Great you're here. A pleasure to be here. Yeah, man. Uh, I was describing a little bit about your, your uh, upbringing, I guess, talking, just introducing you, and I'm just uh, trying to imagine the energy and the intensity of, of growing up with uh, creative professional parents like yours who were also activists and, and passionate about all these things and in that circle of energy and friends. I, I'm sure you felt it as you were growing up all the time, right? Nick, mostly I knew them as mom and dad <laughs> who uh, required of me that which most parents require of their children, which is to go to public school, get good grades, and do the very best you can. Yeah. So of course, I don't have any other parents to compare them to. But yeah, we would find ourselves, my sisters and I, at demonstrations, at union meetings, where my dad would get up and speak, or my mom would uh, speak. Yeah. Oh. Was there music at home? Did either of them sing or play? There was music um, in that, uh, you know, we listened to the radio, to some light jazz, and mom would put on the phonograph, sort of like a CD player for old dinosaurs, you know. <laughs> um, Fats Waller and his rhythm, or Ola Tunji's Drums of Passion, or Harry Belafonte. Yeah. Uh, we were all required, my sisters and I, to take piano lessons. I was the first one to quit. <laughs> and here I'm the only one making a living doing music. Right. But yes, indeed, there was music yeah. at home. Not yeah. blues, though. <laughs> right. And what about, uh, and what about uh, Pete Seeger? When did he come in? How old were you when he came into your world as, as, a, as a person who was part of your family circle? Uh, I got to answer that sort of in stages. I was introduced to his music before I got to meet or see him. I used to go to a summer camp run by his brother, John, oh, those yeah. little red diaper baby uh, camps, you know. <laughs> And so we heard folk songs coming and going. Yeah. And important songs like, uh, which side are you on? And this land is your land. Yeah. Is this and up I, in Vermont? Is that where that came from? Yeah, up in, up in Vermont. Yeah. I bet the folks over on the uh, uh, border in Austria and Hungary right now are, are thinking about singing that song. You know, this land is, you know, this one and right. who. Yeah. Um, so my introduction was indirect, but I fell in love with the banjo right away, the five-string banjo in particular, yeah. and the guitars. There were a few mandolins around, one or two violins, mm -hmm. harmonicas and such. And then uh, I guess a few years later, after I'd seen him, uh, the camp went on a trip to see Pete Seeger in concert, either Vermont or New Hampshire, somewhere fairly nearby. And then lo and behold, one day, while I was a young lad, Pete Seeger showed up at our door, came in talking to mom and dad like they'd known each other forever. I didn't know that we knew this guy. And here, we knew his music. How yeah. about that? And then maybe a few years later, just a few short years later, when I got into my very smug teenagehood, um, Pete came and uh, invited me to come up to he and Toshi's house. Up in Beacon. Uh, yeah. Up in Beacon. To yeah. Toshi, his wonderful, long-suffering wife, as he described her. And uh, he's driving that little red VW, and he's got a little red cap on, and he's driving like this, and he looks at us, so what, uh, guy, uh, what kind of music do you like? So I looked at him like this, James Brown, as if to say, you ever heard of him, old dude? You know, <laughs> teenagehood, it just flooded me. And I, was, I, was, I was due for a, a whooping, I think. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty funny. <laughs> You know, he was the first guy I ever saw play live music, I think when I was about six or seven. He lived, because I grew up near Beacon, and I saw him out on this farm, Saunders Farm, trying to spread the word in various ways. But yeah, he's a, he was an interesting guy to mix music and message in the way he did that, you know. Okay, then you and I have got a lot in common, because I think we know what it is to be sitting down there in the front row and your eyes get big as saucers, and somebody comes out with, say, a chunk of wood with some strings on it, which is just a thing, but he turned it into magic. Yeah. My God, and people yeah. were singing together, and we sounded good. Everybody didn't we? sang, yeah. Yeah. It was good. Now, it's funny because you're, you grew up in New York uh, or, or in Westchester outside of New York City, mostly, right? Uh, yes. And, uh, but your dad was from Georgia, as I understand it. Yeah. And so that, that language must have been, in some way, his, the way he spoke must have, in some way, been an invitation to connect with the blues and other styles of music along the way. I, I, I'm only imagining, but is, is that sort of how it went? Uh, not exactly. It was the way his mother spoke. Oh, yeah? 
My Your grandma, grandma. Oh. that got me into thinking about the countryside and railroad tracks and mountains and rivers and fields and oh. cotton and black hands working through it. Did she stay, stay with you in the summertime? Oh, or yeah, something she like stayed that? with us quite a bit. Yeah. She was um, one of those go-to people in the community. She, I guess, would have been a blues woman had it not been for church. She and my granddad became a, a, a deacon and deaconess in the church, and they were helpers of people. Yeah. My granddad, uh, excuse me, my father uh, was quite an educated man, even though he dropped out of college. He was poor, so he had to do all his homework in the library and get the books out there. Yeah. And he was very well read, and he sounded like it. Yeah. So it wasn't about ain't and y'all. Yeah. You know, maybe. Did he go to Howard? Where did he go? Yeah, Howard University. Howard University. Many moons ago. Yeah. And so he was... He, he spoke with uh, erudition and, and uh, not articulation. Stuffed. Not, yeah. not a stuffed tomato. He, yeah. he spoke very humanly so yeah. you could understand him. Yeah. But he had a good vocabulary. Yeah. So he expected that of you? Uh, let's just say my mom let me know what was expected of me more than my dad did. Yeah. Dad just kind of did what had to be done and made things clear. Yeah. Mom, on the other hand... Uh, wasn't so much for talking, you know. When out of control teenagers come along, she had hands faster than Bruce Lee. <laughs> I mean, you you'd be oh, oh yeah, you know. By the time, but uh, I'd get hit, and I wouldn't realize I'd been hit until my knees were buckling already. I'm going, <laughs> Mayday, Mayday, I'm going down. <laughs> yeah. So um, wow. they were not overstuffed parents. They were yeah. not overly important in themselves or with us as a family. We had a sense of humor. Yeah. We used to come around the supper table and talk and talk about our days, so-and-so at school, so-and-so at the office, so-and-so at this, that, the other. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, it's wild because, uh, you know, I'll just mention this to all our listeners. If you don't uh, know these names, you could check them out. But Ruby D and Ossie Davis, uh, those are some powerful people who, who uh, had a real impact on this this country in ways that are still ongoing and around struggles that are still ongoing. And uh, I'm glad that your family life was as uh, normal as it sounds, that James Brown was part of your teenage world, that the Beatles did what they did to, they did to you, what they did to everybody else probably. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah. And so now do you have kids of your own? I have one son. He yeah. is 25 years old, and um, he lives with me. Um, me and his mom are apart. And uh, this is needed father and son time. Yeah. He's a student of film. He's a student of music. He's playing the harmonica, teaching himself the bass. And just like my dad offered to get me guitar lessons, acting, and all this sort of, and I told him, no, nah, dad, I want to do it on my own. Well, I got, son, I'll show you how to blow this on the harmonica. Let me show you. This. Dad, I'll do it on my own. <laughs> so the cat's in the cradle here. You know? Yeah. Did he try to tell you about... Uh Modern music that you and your old, your music is all old and and uh, oh. done and he he knows better just as you did to your parents. Okay, so to see where we're going there, I, I came up with a song a number of years ago called "Uncle Tom Is Dead," where uh, rap music gets compared to old countryfied blues, and I sort of put those words in his mouth of being a smart smart alecky teen. Now, where would I you know get such an idea? But uh, he doesn't really feel that way he's opening up to a lot of things in fact he's a member of a blues band now, oh wow so what are you gonna do wow <laughs> well you know it's funny because listening to your song a kokomo kid that kind of uh pulse rhyming stuff that's that i would th i would see him recognizing the 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 rap uh vibe there working just fine oh nick he didn't know that he taught me that he played me so many rap records that my ears almost melted off my head but there's a way of tumbling words together, yeah. sometimes out of the rhythm, but they come back into rhythm yeah. at the end of, at end of the line that I managed to use that. In fact, what the last line of the song, uh, I've calmed all of Washington's fears, kept the Supreme Court high for years, got the governors, senators, even representatives waiting for my drop off, medicine for a bad cough. I got a meeting at the Yeah, government. I was feeling well, that, pulse. That, yeah. Okay, so that, yeah, that, yeah I, I got to credit him. Yeah. <laughs> He helped the old man out, you know. It works both ways, yeah. <laughs> well, I will just, before we get back to music, just say that, you know, we uh, can be nostalgic about, about the 60s, but there were things that happened in that climate that had to do with 
uh, very real concerns about war and uh, nuclear, you know, annihilation and uh, lack of trust the government with Nixon and all this stuff going on. And in some ways that, uh, some people feel anyway, that helped foment uh, a kind of art and culture that was vibrant and intense and uh, produced some really amazing stuff. And I wonder if you feel like now we're approaching a similar time where the tension, the pressures, the dangers, the calamitous nature of the things around us are also going to produce that, that uh, sort of boiling up uh, effect in the, in the art world and in the music world. Oh, Nick, I gotta tell you, the boiling up is going on all over here. Yes, in the art world and in the music world. And it pleases me to uh, see groups stand up and send their messages out. But the world is reaching such a boiling point uh, between the haves and the have-nots. And those who have the weapons and those who do, do not have the weapons, uh, the uh, Black Lives Matter shouldn't be versus all lives matter. It should be together. Um, the songs that may have to be sung may be the only things, only weapons left that uh, we have to maybe save our lives. Um, I think it was uh, back during the, what they call the Peekskill riots, 1949, right. 49, uh, Paul Robeson came and sang for a group of folks in the uh, John Birch Society and the anti-communists were all waiting for the, this entertainment, this uh, song festival to end. And when the uh, people driving home from that event uh, would pass a certain, uh, certain route, there were fellows standing with piles of stones all around, they threw stones and broke windows and cars. And I'm not sure if this is a story I heard or if this is what happened, but I understand that came a point at which some of the people in those cars could only get out of those cars, stand together holding hands and singing. And that was all they could do. Yeah. I mean, that was all they could do. So I don't think any of us are here to change the world by blowing it up or shooting it or destroying it or stabbing it. But maybe there are going to have to be times when uh, we got to get right in front of a line of those who would threaten our desire and ability to love one another and sing, to, to sing for our lives. Mm -hmm. I've seen it happen. You've seen it happen. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's, it's powerful. Music is a great connector, and that's sort of what we were talking about even with the Ohalos. This is just it's a universal language, cuts across every boundary, every generation, every obstacle, brings people together. So uh, uh, you know it. I'm glad you're out there doing it. And uh, we've got more music to get to, but, but thanks for sharing that with us. You're welcome. Thanks yeah. for asking yeah. me. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Mr. Guy Davis, let's get back to music. Hi, this is Nick Forster from E-Town. If you want to stay up to date with all the performances, interviews, and behind-the-scenes footage, click the subscribe button. Thanks. <laughs>